thank you very much for coming in person. Welcome to the New America Foundation. My name is Michael Calabrese. I'm a senior research fellow uh, with the asset building program uh, here at New America. And of course, uh, you know, our asset building program is all about promoting uh, savings and, and the development of assets, particularly for low and middle income people across the life course, including retirement, which is uh, retirement policy is something I've focused on uh, quite a lot over the years. Um, so this event is uh, Encore Careers. Can second careers bridge the retirement income gap? And we'll be hearing from the leading advocates of a promising initiative, of course, called Encore Careers, that seeks to give workers uh, approaching what we've, what we've traditionally thought of as retirement age with opportunities to combine continued income uh, and public service. So um, I will introduce just in a minute uh, former Senator Harris Wofford, uh, who will, who um, has been you know a leader of this of this effort, uh, followed by uh, his colleague David Bank, uh, to describe their I their idea and efforts, and then that will be followed by our expert panel of respondents. And one uh, I should mention a housekeeping thing is uh, please remember. Uh, Pretend we're at the movies, uh, turn your cell phones uh, down, at least the ringers off. And um, when we get to Q&A, you know, we'd love to hear from you all, um, you know, uh, any kind of very brief comment and definitely questions. But, uh, but I remember to identify yourselves. We'll come around with a, with a microphone because we need to know where you're from and people on the web will as well. So the basic idea is to catalyze the creation of four to eight year enco encore careers as an attractive alternative to dropping out of the workforce, uh, as too many do as early as 62, the earliest eligibility age for Social Security. From my perspective, the timing of this event is, uh, is very fortuitous. Yesterday I testified before the um, Economic Policy Subcommittee of the Senate Banking Committee. Uh, they held a hearing uh, uh, about our nation's retirement savings deficit. And the data that were presented by the witnesses uh, were really quite sobering. I'd encourage you, if you're interested in that, there's um, uh, uh, Jack Vanderhei from Ebre, for example, did sort of the greatest hits of all Ebre's research on this, and it's quite a, quite a nice package. Um, so there, there is no, what, what I said yesterday was there's no question that widening retirement, the, the widening retirement savings gap is growing insecurity among the nation's 78 million baby boomers. Um, most individuals are simply not saving nearly enough over their working life to supplement today's meager Social Security benefits. Uh, you know, there's been a couple different uh, groups, including Ebre and the Center for Retirement Research at Boston College that have calculated the uh, share of older workers that are at risk of not being able to replace their, um, uh, not being able to replace their pre-retirement standard of living given what they've saved. And they found that between, even among older workers, right, from 45, say between 55 and 64, between 40 and 50 percent are considered at risk. Of, of not even being able to cover, you know, what, what's been their basic uh, cost of living. And the Center for Retirement Research uh, a couple years ago calculated that in, in present value terms, we have a $6.6 .6 trillion retirement income deficit. One key indicator of this problem uh, is very relevant here for this event, and that is despite steadily increasing life expectancies, and, and health care costs that are rising in real terms much faster than inflation on average, nearly half the nation's older workers are, claiming social are still claiming Social Security benefits at age 62, uh, as I said, the earliest age, and as a result, reducing the benefits that they'll receive later uh, in life, uh, you know, which they'll really need as they live into their 80s by 30 percent or more. Uh, and I'm sure Steve Goss will tell us more about that. I see his head, head nodding. So right now we'll hear about how Encore, Encore Careers can address this um, as well as um, uh, give a boost to public service and discuss the questions it raises about the implications for the size, shape, and direction of our labor markets. 
uh, going forward. So first up will be former Senator Harris Wofford, and I, and I, and I should I should give the caveat that I think for everyone else, I'm, I'm just going to give their name, rank, and serial number because you have bios. Um, but, but for Senator Wofford, I just want to say a few extra things because I, I've been a, a long time uh, a fan of his. And, and he's been a lifelong civil rights activist and advocate for, for citizen service. As a, as a White House aide to President Kennedy, um, he played a key role in launching the Peace Corps and was later worked closely with Sergeant Shriver, was an envoy for the Peace Corps. Uh, then later, as a senator, played a key role in both crafting uh, and working to pass the legislation that created AmeriCorps uh, and the Learn, uh, Learn, and, Learn and Serve America program. Then, after his time in the Senate, uh, he, he, he then served for six years as the CEO of the Corporation for National and Community Service, which runs those uh, domestic service uh, programs. So I could go on and on, He's many years a college president, uh, all sorts of other things, but uh, I think we'll stop there and, and give him the time to speak. Senator? Thank you, Michael. Um, <clears throat> Not yet lifelong, fortunately. I'm uh, lucky to have had a number of uh, encore opportunities. Uh, it, it should be your hope, too, f if you're lucky to live for um, eight uh, decade, eight score and six uh, years. Uh, the younger generation, I, I found, doesn't actually know what score is, but. <laughs> but um, now, th th by the way, Chris Matthews um, gave me new life. Um, but, uh, and by the way, I was 65 years old when I had the opportunity to go to the Senate, and 70 when I had the great privilege, uh, I'll put it that way for the moment, of bequeathing Rick Santorum onto the Senate of the United States, who <laughs> defeated me. Almost no one has ever introduced me as uh, they, they tell the, the, the success examples, but no one has ever uh, told the other side of a resume. Uh, and, <laughs> and no one has ever really introduced me saying, and he was beaten by Rick Santorum, <laughs> right? Uh, which would have given some electricity at the current moment. Um, R R R Chris Matthews on Hardball talking about, actually it was on Al Sharpton's show, talking about his book, um, uh, Jack Kennedy, an elusive hero um, was asked to give some of the examples of things that the Kennedys, that particularly the president, had done uh, in the field of civil rights that surprised Al Sharpton that if you added them up, uh, they were really quite an extraordinary record. And uh, he said that a good thing, thing or two about me and my colleague in the civil rights section of the Kennedy campaign, Louis Martin, said, and, Louis Martin is no longer with us, but and he ended with as if it was Saturday Night Live. He said, "But Harris Wofford is still alive." <laughs> right. So, I, I will do my best. Uh, I was asked to give a uh, frame for uh, the the panel to follow. Uh, follow. That's rather challenging because I've been not in this room, but in the New America. Foundation uh, discussions, and many of them have been extraordinarily uh, lively and good. And I hope uh, the panel that I look forward to hearing uh, will s start that kind of a discussion. And I look forward to David Bank um, giving, laying out, once I finish, uh, the, the um, facts of life as, the, as he and Mark Friedman and uh, Civic Ventures, whose board I had the delightful privilege to be on for some years. Um, and I, I will be delighted to pass this torch to David in just a few minutes. The frame for the conversation about an aging America, for me, uh, the watchwords would be, we have to be more inventive if we're going to do our duty. Now, it's interesting to me, and uh, you might ponder it, how similar 
uh, the needs of what I would think of as aging Americans um, are uh, alongside of, parallel with the needs of not just older Americans, but younger Americans. I'll, I'll explain what I mean, in, uh, though it may be a self-evident truth to all of you. Uh, and to veterans. I spent the morning with a group of veterans um, who, uh, the leader of whom, Eric Greitens, who wrote this wonderful book, uh, Fist and Heart, uh, on his life as a Navy SEAL in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, before that, a Rhodes Scholar, a middleweight boxing champion at Duke, a White House fellow, a quite, a quite extraordinary uh, man uh, who, when he came home, uh, decided he'd visit the most wounded and surviving colleagues that he had in Iraq and Afghanistan. And uh, some of them were at Walter Reed, Bethesda, and he spent the day asking how they were and also what they would like to do if they, um, when they get out. Almost all of them said, I want to go back to our unit in the uh, armed forces. Almost none of them will be able to do that. And he said, well, what if you can't do that? What would you like? And if he added up all his answers, every one of them wanted to do something that was good for the community, for the country, um, something that was good, that was service. Um, they, they, they talked about being coaches of of kids to help them avoid alcoholism and drug addiction, um, uh, helping police, uh, community policing, a whole range of things. And he started the Mission Continues, based in St. Louis, generously funded by various foundations now for fellowship, a, a number of things. But the central uh, program of the Mission Continues is uh, to offer fellowships for six months, in some cases more, uh, of work in the nonprofit field, in the service field in one form or another, well-carved assignments uh, where they really wanted the veterans to help uh, be leaders in, in efforts of those particular projects that they went to. Several hundred have uh, been these fellows, and it's, uh, it's, a, it's a, a true success story. But the morning discussion that began at 745, uh, led by veterans, um, was how do we apply this principle, not just to a few, but to the millions that are involved in the GI Bill and uh, I think you'll hear more of, more of this in due, in, in due course uh, in the next, uh, this year. Uh, it, and it calls to our attention, uh, my attention at least, the, the best thing I think our country as a public policy and action ever undertook, which was the GI Bill. I say it was self-centered in the sense that it helped me go to college and to law school. It opened the door to millions of people. Remember, it's a voucher you get, and then you have the choice of where you want to apply. Um, and the institutions that you apply to, colleges, universities, job training programs, uh, and so now it's extended to apprenticeships and such, um, uh, they, they choose whether to seek you and compete for you and whether they have something to offer. Uh, my Republican friends might, might say this is a very Republican sort of approach. Uh, vouchers and the market principle in both cases, the individuals and the institutions. And they're exploring how you might apply the same principle to the whole of the veterans community in the GI Bill, not just grants that you get from foundations to expand a program like that. Well, then you look at aging America, uh, and I'd say the other end of the spectrum at young America. And in uh, both of those years, um, ages, essentially the same thing is needed by millions of young people and older Americans. Uh, I think in terms of being inventive, uh, 
the idea of the encore career uh, that Mark Friedman and his tremendously instructive uh, books uh, and civic ventures is advancing uh, is a transformative idea that uh, I, I hope the panel in one form or another will uh, look at and consider and that and we will use that as an invitation uh, to be more inventive. Now uh, I came to some of this as CEO of the Corporation for National Service in the 1990s when we needed to, uh, Clinton wanted help in saving AmeriCorps that had just been terminated by the sweep of uh, Republicans of both houses of Congress. For one of their first acts was to terminate AmeriCorps. Uh, that roller coaster continues. The, one of the first acts of the new Congress, House of Representatives, this case only one house, voted to terminate AmeriCorps. Um, and and that's, that's another story. But the, the, the Serve America Act of, uh, named for Ted Kennedy, the last bill he shepherded on the floor of the, of the uh, Congress, of the Senate, um, after the health care bill, before and after the health care bill, um, was the Serve America Act which calls for a quantum leap in service of all ages and very specifically also of older Americans, uh, including the proposal for encore fellowships that's in the act. Um, the quantum leap of AmeriCorps, of, of national service positions, not necessarily AmeriCorps, uh, from uh, 75,000 to 250,000 in the next five years, according to the bill. Um, that hasn't been funded adequately, obviously. It's a holding operations. It's fighting to keep the present level of funding and not be cut. But that bill is there. It was passed with Republican majorities in all the committees that advanced it, with Republican support um, in all four of the committees, and by the ranking or the chairing Republican in those committees, um, Sen Senator uh, of Wyoming, Enzi got up and said, this is the most truly bipartisan action that we've ever experienced. And I hope we'll learn to apply this to some other areas. Well, these areas we're talking about today, it seems to me, uh, are, are, are very vital uh, to our body politic. Um, the light bulb went on in my head for, for part of this um, when you know, I, I have to say it's gone on several times in my life. Once as a very young man out of college, in college, I traveled to Europe on a troop ship. Uh, it turned into a student ship at, right after World War II. And uh, there was a group of young men singing night and day, too late at night. And, and I, I cornered one, what are you doing? And he said, well, we're young Mormons. And when we turn come of age, the question is not, will we serve and go on a mission? Uh, but where, at home or abroad, and we chose devastated Europe to go to. Uh, I think that's where Mitt Romney chose to go to, if I'm remembering right. Um, but the, the, uh, I said to myself, um, you know, that's something that, something like that should be asked of, of all young Americans coming of age. Um, and I would personally extend it to if not then, when you do it very young, do it when you're older. We desperately, as head of the Peace Corps in Africa then, as the representative to Africa living in Ethiopia for two years, uh, doubling the number of secondary school teachers they had with GA, mostly with BA generalists, we desperately needed older, experienced teachers as part of that venture. Uh, and we had about 20 in their 60s and 70s, and they were tremendously helpful. Um, but the, the, the light bulb to the fundamental idea that I want to close with and start with um, is, is uh, reflected by the, mo the moment uh, I was painting, no, scraping the walls of a, of a building that um, the service co Youth Service Corps of Philadelphia was building 
on, on one of these service days. I'm not sure it was Martin Luther King Day, but it was um, an eventful day. Uh, and I uh, was told that the young African American who was going to be next to me on that wall uh, scraping um, was, had been a gang leader, had uh, dropped out of school, was on his way to disaster and, and probably to the penitentiary. Um, and he joined the service corps. And he was, he had become the star of this remarkable group of young people. And I said to him, why did you take that turn and join this program? And he said, well, he said, I think uh, it was because I wanted to meet different kind of people. Um, and, and then he said, and I didn't want to get killed at the end of what I was doing. And then we went back to work, and I think he perceived that I was earnest. And, and he turned and said, you know, the real reason is because in the projects where I grew up, uh, good people were coming to do good things and to help me. And they kept coming. And I think I got tired of these good people doing good against me. <laughs> and, 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 th and then he said, this is the first time in my life anyone had ever asked me to do something good. And he basically said, it's fun. And um, the light bulb really went on. I said, you know, we all need that. Uh, the young and the old and the in-between. Um, so that, that's the frame I want to put to you. And I, I, I do want to say, if you're, if you're going to try to figure out how to be inventive, as I hope some, a number of us here will do, in any one of these three fields, the, the young, the old, and the veterans, um, you want to, to, to move to that, f I used the word transformative before, transformative idea that you're not um, asking, seeing people as uh, victims, um, but as agents for action and for good work. Not as, as victims, but as contributors. Uh, not as liabilities, but as assets. And um, for a while I was, uh, for a while the program lasted, I was uh, an ex national spokesperson for um, the experience wave, uh, an affiliate of Civic Ventures, an outgrowth of Mark Friedman's uh, ideas. Um, the, the, the experience wave was is that there is a wave coming of the boomer generation that everybody is worried is going to sink Social Security. It's a terrible problem we're facing. Um, or as Rick Santorum said in, when he was campaigning against me and was asked, what's the problem with Social Security? And, and Rick was on tape, and it almost won us the election. It pulled us ahead for a few days um, when we put it on television. He, at Temple University, he said, well, the problem with Social Security is that when it w the law was passed, people assumed that almost everybody would be dead by 65, but now they're living to 70, 75, 80, 85. That's the problem with Social Security. <laughs> and, and, and you know, then he had a couple of answers, such as raising the level of age. Um, the, the, the dependency idea is an idea that uh, needs to be counteracted or balanced. Um, and in, in most of the youth field, the great organizations have had a difficult time turning their battleships around uh, to include the service route. Um, they are instilled with the desire to help young people. Uh, and you know, even City Year that started with that idea, suddenly a group of them in Boston uh, said at a retreat, you know, we're not practicing what we preach. We say it's better to be s to serve than to be served, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And all we're doing with the young people we're working in our after school programs is serving them. We haven't asked them. And so they went back to their classes and all and asked them. And the young people said, let's let us 
they named themselves Young Heroes and they had uh, sa 13 Saturdays of service and various things and it was partly seeing that that turned Rick Santorum around by the way who ended by supporting AmeriCorps. I think that would uh, help sink him as a candidate if, if I advertised that he, <laughs> he flip-flopped and became a, a supporter of national service. But that's the idea that um, I think the boomer generation is ready for. Um, I, I think finding the ways and means and how to do it is, is uh, a challenge. It's a challenge to the area agencies on aging who are instilled with the, the idea of help, the therapeutic approach. Um, and I respect the work they do, but lifting sites uh, to this other, it's a, you know, another version of ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. Ask not what can be done for you, but what you can do. And we all need to be asked. I've been lucky to be asked. And uh, I think the room has a lot of people here who uh, have heard the call that they're asked. And we need to find out how to make that call practical and uh, loud and uh, uh, taking as the other watchword of America and I hope of the new America is all, that all men uh, are created equal. All men and women, old and young, need to be asked and need to be able to do something good. Thank you. So uh, thank you, uh, Senator. Uh, next up is, is David Bank, who is uh, the Vice President of Civic Ventures, which is the organization that has been developing uh, th this concept of Encore Careers. And, and David um, was also, by background, a journalist, a technology reporter for the Wall Street Journal and launched the paper's uh, philanthropy, philanthropy beat, right? Good. All right, David. Should we do something with the, can we just kill the lights up here maybe? I don't know. What do you think? Can you see it all? Um, so first we want to thank MetLife Foundation which funded the research that we're going to talk about and, and for all their past support of, of Civic Ventures and Encore Careers. Uh, I'm David Bank, as Michael said. Um, I had uh, I'd put, uh, uh, I'm from Civic Ventures out in San Francisco, and I had said, insert joke here, but I think I'll, uh, I'll skip the San Francisco <laughs> joke. Um, thank you, Harris, for your wonderful remarks, and thanks to all of you for coming out. Um, and thanks to the panelists who we'll meet in a moment, and thanks very much to New America for bringing us all together. Um, the, the proximate reason for today's event is this research that we've put out over the past year about uh, encore careers in the aftermath of the of the recession and the economic downturn and we'll get into that in a bit um, but there's a, a, a connection that I want to make with New America Foundation itself because um, I think be, uh, about 10 years ago uh, the founders Ted Ted Halstead and also Michael Lind uh, uh, put out a book called the Radical Center that devoted a fair amount of time um, to uh, to this notion of a of both a new social contract and a reinvigorated American community, but also a new vision of, of, of an aging America where older adults work, contribute, and participate in much broader and, and deeper ways. And they called out a, a, as an intergenerational win-win older people working with young people in childcare and in schools. So uh, we feel that this is, uh, 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 we feel very much at home here with New America, and so we're very happy to be here. Um, uh, at Civic Ventures, we're on a campaign to establish encore careers and really what we think of as a whole new sort of encore stage of life. Uh, it's really a, a sort of experiment in social construction, a way to reframe, as Harris said, um, uh, that opens the way for, for invention and innovation. Um, uh, I guess I want to click through all this. Um, what we saw is that retirement, um, in either its golden years form, uh, uh, 
maybe this one, um, or, its, or its sort of downsized version, is really a, a dead letter, or is at least being dramatically postponed for, for a whole variety of reasons. Um, just about two-thirds of people see that the next stage of their life um, is really about um, a new stage of work of some kind, um, by choice or by necessity. So the competition um, in, the, in the marketplace of ideas really is what is the shape of that new stage? Is it going to be an aspirational, rewarding payoff for a, for a life well lived, or is it a sort of more desultory grind uh, driven by financial insecurity? So uh, in the spirit of, of, of name it and claim it, we've, uh, we've tried to establish Encore as the best brand for that new stage, um, uh, a sort of hybrid that combines, uh, that works for both the want to works and the, and the, ha and the need to works, and delivers that kind of intergenerational win-win that, that Ted Halstead and Michael Lind were talking about. Um, ah, purpose, passion, and a paycheck. Um, uh, Encore careers are already here. Uh, we, we found that there's estimated 9 million people um, already in their Encore careers. Those are people between 44 and 70. Um, that's up a little bit since uh, 2008, so even during the downturn it continued to grow, um, uh, not by much. And it's a, it's a rolling number. Um, more people, you know, people leave their Encore careers at some point and, and more people enter. Um, of this 31 million, uh, we found that about 6 million say they plan to enter and make the transition to their Encore careers in the next five years. Uh, they're, they're doing, and, and Encore careers, remember, specifically has to do with fields that um, have some kind of social purpose or social impact. So people in their Encore careers are working uh, the biggest chunk is in is in education, as, as teachers and in other roles, in healthcare, um, in government, and then and also in nonprofit and community organizations. Uh, altogether, we found or we estimated. Uh, you can take this number for what it's worth: 16.7 billion hours of Encore labor each year. Um, and just to give you a comparison, a uh, frame of reference, um, there's about 8.1 billion hours of volunteer work uh, contributed each year by by people of all ages. So. Uh, so that's the, that's the Encore uh, labor contribution. And uh, these are folks uh, from all strata, all socioeconomic uh, groups, not just elite or, or, or affluent. In fact, one of the interesting things about the survey was um, very little difference between people in, in economic terms, between people interested in Encore careers and those who are not. The, the, the median was about $50,000 of, of income, um, half had ass assets of under $150,000, a third had assets of, of under $50,000. So to what Michael was saying about a, a, a retirement savings gap, um, uh, it, it cuts across uh, uh, bo both people who want Encore careers and those who were less interested. Um, we did find, of course, um, the widespread financial anxiety. Um, uh, the, the numbers are, are, are fairly common to, uh, fairly um, uh, well known to us now. Um, but this is what's both um, what's driving Encore careers, and it's also what makes it uh, makes people nervous about making the switch. Um, so uh, uh, there's a whole raft of concerns about why people might not want to make the, uh, the jump to Encore careers. Um, and, 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 and these are also you know, fairly predictable. Um, and uh, just to be to lay our cards on the table, we actually found that the most enthusiastic group um, about Encore careers has actually fallen by about a quarter since 2008. So um, the, the, the notion that, hey, maybe just stick with what I'm doing might be a better, a better uh, a, a better option, um, you know, is, is definitely out there. Um, but, the, but overall, the takeaway is that income security is kind of a gating factor for Encore careers, that um, people need to get past that concern before they even get to consider the sort of relative luxury of, of having a, a work that's driven by, by purpose or passion. So, so it's sort of the price of admission, and we need to take it seriously. Um, to sort out this whole mix of issues, we, we segmented the, the, the people who were interested in Encores, what we called potential Encores, um, and they kind of fell out into three, three pretty distinct groups. And the, 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 the smallest group um, uh, are the ones who were least concerned about their income in retirement, had the highest, uh, the highest average income. Um, they tended to be college and, and post-college graduates. Uh, and uh, they want their Encore careers to be about helping others, staying active, being productive, achieving personal fulfillment. 
And when we get that pushback, which we often get, that encore careers are really an option only for the elite or the, the educated, this is frankly the group that people are talking about. They're, they're early adopters, as it were, and they're finding their own pathways to encore careers. And they're probably going to do it more or less without institutional supports. In fact, they already have, and there haven't really been that many institutional supports. Um, in contrast, there's a, about a third of, of the potential encores are interested mostly because they were looking for a source of continued income and benefits. Um, they may be in social purpose roles in healthcare, in education, in green jobs, um, but they also want to stay, and they want to stay active and, and productive, but they're less specifically motivated by a desire to, to help others. Now, the biggest group actually is in the middle, and that's something like 14 million people of, the, of, those, of those 31 million. Um, and they share the passion of the passion firsters, but they have the income insecurity of the paycheck firsters. Um, and they're, they're most likely to say that their personal financial situation has deteriorated through the downturn, and they're most likely to be concerned about losing their job. But at the same time, they're the most fired up about encore careers. Um, and they're most responsive to the messaging, and they really see that potential for both the personal and the social win-win. Interestingly, um, uh, they're also the most of all the groups uh, guided by faith and, and spirituality in their decisions. And they're also the youngest group, uh, and they expect to have the longest encore careers. Um, so they want to fulfill their, their desire to step up and, and make a difference, but they also need to, 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 uh, to satisfy their, 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 income, their income security needs. So, uh, so if we want to move on core careers beyond the sort of early adopters and the, and the, and the, and the boutique uh, uh, and into the mass market, um, we need to help people do what they already want to do and what they need to do, which is build purpose-driven, financially secure lives. Um, there's no one-size-fits-all on core career. A 50-something like, like me might make a switch to a full-time, full-pay new career that might carry him or her into their late 60s or beyond. Um, someone at 62 might shift more to a, a sort of part-time role or other kind of uh, flexible role that extends their income to perhaps 70. And it turns out that even modest levels of continued income can make a dramatic uh, uh, difference on your lifetime financial security. So um, it's always a question of sort of compared to what. Um, if you're unemployed, you're already retired and ends aren't, aren't really meeting, or you can't keep going in a physically demanding job, or you need additional flexibility because you've got caregiving responsibilities or, or any, any host of other reasons, continuing to work at least part-time and earn a modest income is still a good idea. It lets you postpone claiming Social Security, which gives you that higher benefit that Michael mentioned. Um, it defers the drawdown of whatever other assets you have and lets them continue to grow, hopefully. Um, and it means those assets have to cover fewer years. So you really do get a multiple effect. Um, and just like there's no one-size-fits-all uh, encore career, there's no one-size-fits-all transition. Um, uh, there does seem to be some common experience around the transition um, in terms of sort of psychic challenges and economic challenges. And it turns out that the transition itself, rather than the encore career that you eventually get into, um, really the, those challenges are the biggest obstacle to activating those 31 million people. So from Civic Ventures' point of view and from, from a strategic point of view, we think that the transition is where we can get the biggest bang for the, for the buck. So let's talk about that for a second. Um, uh, the, 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 first, uh, the first thing is to normalize this as a transition. People think about transitions um, out of college, perhaps, um, other kinds of, of life transitions. Um, we want to sort of disabuse the expectation that uh, you can jump from your old life into your, into your new, new thing overnight, um, and that if you don't do that, you're somehow, um, you're, you're, you're somehow not, not being successful. It does take a while for people to get the kind of experience through volunteering or an internship or what have you, or the training or education to get a, a certificate. Um, uh, we found that of the nine million people who had already made their, their encore transition, um, uh, uh, something like a sixth took about w one to two years, another sixth took two to three years, and, uh, and a whole quarter, 26 percent, took three or more years to really find their footing in their encore careers. Um, I think on average the, the, it was an 18-month transition that people reported. So carving out 18 months when you don't have uh, a f a full income is not an easy thing, and that becomes <coughs> a, a barrier, and particularly to low-income people, people don't have the assets to carry them 
them through that, two-thirds of the people who had made the transition to Encore careers reported that they had had significant gaps in income during that transition, um, nearly a quarter or no money at all during their transition. So, um, and uh, for most of the folks, the gap was at least six months, and for a third, they had a gap of at least two years. So this is, a, this is the serious issue here. Um, people who, who, who have made the transition mostly relied on their personal savings, so by definition, if you don't have those savings, you're, in effect, uh, precluded from getting to your encore career, even though that encore career may be, able, may be economically beneficial in terms of your, your future earnings. Um, and so not surprisingly, half of the people who, who are interested in encore careers expect the transition to be very difficult, and of those, most say that it's a, a financial issue. Um, whoops. Um, so the first step is obviously um, some kind of financial planning uh, and a, re a rethinking of financial planning because that, like we're saying, that temporary dip in income uh, can be justified if you think of it as an investment in a, in a longer term stage of work uh, that will allow you to, to, to boost, to top up your assets and, and improve your long term security. Um, we've talked to a number of financial services providers about providing that kind of, of, of advice and even creating what could be called individual purpose accounts, um, uh, maybe companions to, to individual retirement accounts to specifically save for and manage the financing of Encore transitions. Um, the survey indicated some pretty straightforward ways to, to help people, um, grants and scholarships for the, for the training and education, volunteer programs that can help people get the hands-on experience, other kinds of experience through um, national community service. Uh, community colleges, of course, are key for, for the training and certification part. Um, and in particular, as Harris was saying, national and, and community service has huge potential as an encore transition pathway. Um, this is Gary Maxworthy, who's one of our favorite examples. He was a food executive who used his Vista experience to work in a San Francisco food bank, and he was, he was appalled at the lack of fresh produce, uh, fruits and vegetables um, uh, that, that were being distributed, and he set up a collection system and a distribution system through all the food banks in California, and I just checked this morning that last year they delivered 125 million pounds of fresh produce to families in California. Um, uh, and, he, and it all started with his Vista, with his Vista experience. Um, Civic Ventures has a model that we've been that we've been expanding of what we call Encore Fellowships, and these are one-year, modestly paid gigs placed in nonprofit organizations that give mostly business professionals a foot in the door of the nonprofit sector. Um, there are about a dozen or so of these around the country, and they're expanding fast. And last year, Intel Corporation announced that they were extending this uh, program to all U.S. eligible, all reti uh, retirement eligible U.S. employees. So they're covering a $25,000 stipend, some part of the health coverage, and helping people get matched into their into their positions. Um, and then the other th one of the other findings we found is that. Um, uh, a large number of people, we estimated at something like uh, 12 million people, are interested in starting their own s small ventures or nonprofits, but, but also businesses uh, that employ themselves and, and others. Um, and, th and so there's a big need for, uh, for mentorship and, and obviously financing assistance to help people get these small businesses going. This is consistent with findings from Kauffman Foundation and others that uh, that this age group 55 to 64 actually the most likely to, to start small small businesses um, contrary to uh, uh, sort of impressions of, 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 of 20 somethings um, so investments in that transition can have a big payoff um, all the respondents uh, reported that they expect to work longer now than they expected to uh, uh, before the before the downturn. But those in Encore Careers said they expected, and those interested in Encore Careers said they expected to work even longer. Um, so uh, people who are currently in Encore Careers expect to work till they're 66 and a half, and those interested in Encore Careers almost as long, and they plan to spend um, uh, eight years or more in their in their Encore Careers. Um, Another interesting finding that Stephen might be interested in, when people understood the benefits of postponing Social Security claims, um, uh, sort of pre and post m messaging on that, um, the, the, their interest in working longer uh, dramatically increased. So, um, so one notion is, can, if you were going to claim Social Security, could some part-time encore career type job that paid as much or more than that minimum benefit uh, uh, encourage you to postpone that, that, 
that claim and then you get the higher benefits for life after that. Um, so we think there's a real opportunity to drive economic and fiscal benefits for the whole society. So the increased spending power of older adults who have continued income is a uh, significant boost to, to GDP and, and thus to, to jobs and, and employment. Um, that drives tax revenues and, and, uh, and benefits to the Social Security Trust Fund. Um, we have the privilege of having Stephen Goss here. Um, I wasn't sure of that when I put these remarks together, so I was going to quote him. I think I'll still do that to put him on the spot. Um, uh, uh, he can really tell you the real numbers, but entirely separate from any reduction in benefits, any, any increase in the, in the eligibility age for Social Security, actually encouraging people to work longer, and so raising the median retirement age uh, to 67, the, the actual retirement age, not the statutory retirement age. Um, and that is the, the, that is the um, statutory retirement age for people uh, born 1960 or later, um, would cut Social Security's long-term shortfall nearly in half. So this is not just at the margins of, of the fiscal discussion. This is actually could be a, a, a serious policy uh, option. Um, just to quote him from, from a finance committee, Senate Finance Committee hearing a couple years ago, finding ways to encourage people to actually go and do more work will greatly benefit the finance of Social Security, Medicare, and really all the retirement and health systems within this country. So Stephen, you'll get to uh, put all the caveats and asterisks on that. Um, so just to sum it up, uh, Oh, sorry, I wanted to be there. Um, encore, uh, encore careers are, are, a, are a way to use carrots versus sticks uh, to encourage and enable people to do what they already want to do, what's good for them and good for all of us. It's a win-win that should be taken seriously uh, by policymakers tackling the challenges of an aging society. And the first win is a, is, is a windfall of talent for all kinds of social needs that may otherwise be met. This is Lillian Rice, um, who's teaching Native American language and culture to, 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 to children. Um, so that was the 16.7 the, the billion hours. The second win is increased financial security. Um, uh, people are just waking up, as, as Michael uh, was saying, to the reality of how woefully inadequate their retirement savings are. So longer work is going to be a reality. Um, that can either be seen as a punishment uh, and a bummer or an opportunity for some innovative new arrangements. And finally, the third win of a revitalized economy and at least at the margins more balanced budgets. Uh, one of the primary indicators of an aging society is the dependency ratio. Um, but what would happen to that ratio if the many older adults uh, who want to and are able to contribute were, weren't so dependent? Um, by extension, that would create more resources for those who, uh, for health reasons and others, are not able to. Um, encore careers are not one policy or, or program, um, but really a, a movement or a, a, a reinvention, um, as, as Harris was saying. It really touches almost every institution and, and really each of our lives. Um, what we want to leave you with is the trend is real. Um, it's happening. At, at some level, it's inevitable. Uh, but with a little bit of investment and a lot of leadership, we can make it a truly mass market phenomena, uh, a new social norm where people just naturally ask, so what are you doing for an encore? Great. Thank you, David. I'll ask the, you know, the panel to uh, come up, and David, you could come join us as well. And what we'll do is um, just go right down, I think, the line w with some, you know, just a, a few minutes of opening remarks. So I think what I'll do is, um, I think I'll introduce you all first. Uh, that may work work better. I don't usually like to do that, but um, but since they have your bios, people can you can refer back as as individuals speak. So starting from uh, fr from the far end, there is my colleague Phil Longman, who is um, a longtime research fellow here at the New America uh, Foundation, currently with the Health Policy uh, Program, and a Schwartz Senior Fellow at the Washington Monthly, where he writes many cover stories that you all have probably. Right, and, and I thought it was, it was in interesting. I, I didn't know until today that um, Phil's obviously been thinking about this for a little while. 25 years ago, his first book was called, um, <clears throat> or is called, Born to Pay, The New Politics of Aging in America. So that's, uh, v you know, very, uh, very appropriate. Um, next we have um, Nancy Altman, who 
um, is the co-director of Strength and Social Security um, and, and co-director of Social Security Works. And, and I, I know her from uh, her, her service as chairman of the board of one of my uh, favorite organizations, the Pension Rights Center. Uh, Stephen Goss, who's been, been mentioned, is the, uh, the chief actuary of the Social Security Administration. Um, in fact, for so long, you, we don't even need to mention what you did before that, right? <laughs> 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 and, uh, and, and, and Deborah Banda is the state director of ARP Massachusetts. For, so ARP in the state of Massachusetts since 1999. And it's really impressive I, that ARP has 825,000 members in Massachusetts. That's, that's, that's quite something. So why don't we, um, I guess, start with Phil, and we can come, I think, straight down the line. Thank you, Michael. Um, I, I first just want to associate myself everything that's been said so far. I mean, this is an extremely important topic uh, at a personal level. Uh, I think I might be on my second or third encore career. Um, my wife is busy trying to open an Etsy shop. Uh, so I'm all for encore careers. And uh, not only at a personal level, but obviously from a fiscal point, point of view, this is very important. So, and I'm particularly, uh, I'd like to associate myself with the remarks of, of Senator Wofford about the importance of, of national service and of, of giving back. Um, but my, my, my role that I've been asked to play here is, is to be something of a skeptic. And I, and I, and I, so I just want to um, add some points of information um, and some cautionary notes about where this kind of talk could go if it doesn't go the right way. Um, so how many of you here have heard formulations like 70 is the new 60, <laughs> right? <laughs> right. Um, this is probably one of the greatest factoids of American life. You know, we hear over and over and over again that we're in the midst of this longevity revolution. Now, I've just come back from Kalamazoo where I had the sad duty to um, bury my grandmother who died at 102. So yes, <laughs> I'm well aware that there are certain individuals in our society who are living to amazing old ages. However, this is very much a class phenomenon. Life expectancy at age at birth has not changed at all since the 19, early 1970s for the half of the population that earns less than the median income. More to the point, really, is that the health of the population is deteriorating so that today's late middle-aged people are on whole, and particularly among uh, the, those of lesser social economic status, is actually worse than what was uh, the case among their counterparts uh, 20 or 30 years ago. So we're now at the point where among the cohort that's now between the ages of 45 and 64, almost a third of them, according to the Census Bureau, are officially disabled. Um, not only that, there's a very important piece in, in a study coming out in, in health affairs uh, about a year ago, you know, that showed that rates of disability among the late middle aged are going up and up and up. Now this is despite all the money that we're putting into health care right? Probably the largest single commonsensical explanation is the gigantic explosion in obesity and sedentary lifestyle in our time. Um, but nonetheless, um, this is a reality of the next generation of elders. The next great big factoid um, that really just drives me insane and has, I guess, throughout my entire adult life, um, I was reminded of it not so long ago when Tom Brokaw had a great new special on uh, boomers. Um, Tom Brokaw, of course, wrote about the greatest generation. Now, it, it's our, now it's our turn to get the Tom Brokaw treatment. And uh, they spelled 
boomers in this documentary with a, a dollar sign at, for the S on the end, reinforcing this other stereotype that's out there, that not only are boomers um, living longer than any generation in history, but they're wealthier than any generation in history, and therefore, as per Rick Santorum, um, doesn't it make sense that they would also work longer than any other generation, right? Well, let me just recite a few facts, right? Um, how many people in this room are not college graduates? One. Seventy percent of the baby boom generation is not college graduate. You know, how many work in a physically demanding job? I'm none that I see, right? According to a report that came out from McKinsey Institute uh, two years ago, 50% of baby boomers work in physically demanding jobs. You know, that includes 14% that work in occupations like police, fire, food preparation. Only 21% of baby boomers are professionals. So we're talking about a generation that is overwhelmingly blue collar. And so we have to be very careful in painting a picture of this generation in its old age as one of people who are so healthy and so wealthy and so privileged that why shouldn't they just work to 67 or 70 or whatever? Because that's not where we're going. In fact, where we're going is someplace unbelievably worse if we don't pay attention to it. You know, we have all lived through an era, I think everybody in this room, for their entire lifetime, the socioeconomic status of the elderly as a group has continuously improved to the point by the 1980s, the elderly as a group were substantially better off than children, than middle-aged and, and younger people. Well, we're about to come on an inflection point where that will no longer be true. The socioeconomic status of the elderly is about to drop tremendously, including their health status. And that requires a whole new kind of advocacy for the elderly, and one that will not um, be helped if we continue to push an image of the, of the baby boom generation as a bunch of yuppies ready, to, ready for their encore careers. Thank you. The, um, the social security system is extremely well designed, both um, to provide economic security to the, the uh, population Phil was just talking about, and also to enable Encore careers. It's really wonderfully designed for both. It is, we often talk about a single statutory defined retirement age, but actually it's more accurate to think of Social Security as having a band of ages. The earliest age at which one can claim benefits, as you know, is age 62. For every month you delay, you have what's called an actuarially equivalent adjustment. The idea is you're getting one month less, uh, you're getting one month less of benefits and therefore you get a slight increase so that on average you, you come out the same place. Um, and the concept behind that is to be neutral. It neither subsidizes any particular retirement age nor penalizes any particular retirement age. The idea is that people are free to choose starting at 62 and through after 70, there aren't those actuarial adjustments, but certainly between 62 and 70, other factors um, play a role about whether to claim those benefits or not. It also, unlike the rest of our retirement system, is, is virtually totally portable between jobs. You carry it from job to job. You, there are multi-employer defined benefit plans that are within a, an industry portable, but employer-provided defined benefit plans, other than the multi-employer plans, are not portable, which means young workers um, who, who switch jobs are really getting very little benefit from it. Similarly, defined contribution plans, when you um, often people take lump sums, and that money often never makes it to retirement. So it has that advantage, too, that you switch jobs, you take an encore career, it is totally portable. You continue to, to accrue benefits. It, again, it is exquisitely designed to both accommodate, to accommodate part-time or less remunerative work. After the, the statutorily defined retirement age, it's an annuity. And so at that point, you can claim benefits whenever you want, and whether you work or not, you 
you get those um, benefits and it's an actuarially equivalent amount depending on when you claim. Prior to that, you can earn up to, uh, it's just under $15,000 this year. If you earn over that amount, you don't get, your full benefits are reduced or even eliminated or with, I should say withheld temporarily so that when you reach the, um, you, you stop working, stop drawing cash salary as someone who's been a mom at home, I always say like just different, you work <laughs> whether you're paid or not. Uh, but um, you, after that, um, when you cease getting cash income or after you reach the um, full retirement age, you, you get the adjustment, you get the benefit of that. So as I say, it is, it's wonderfully designed. It's really its only shortcoming is that the benefits are too low. That um, often, the, the, um, David talked about the, those um, with the, the purpose and the paycheck who would like to encourage careers but financially can't do it. And Social Security generally is not enough um, without any kind of supplementation to provide that. Fortunately, we have some <coughs> wonderful new trends. Just today, Senator Harkin introduced a bill in the Senate, which will increase benefits across the board and get an improved um, cost of living adjustment so benefits don't erode over time. Um, the AFL-CIO, several, <coughs> two weeks ago, um, came out with a policy statement urging increased um, benefits. Social Security, since its enactment, has provided workers with freedom and choice, including the choice to change jobs and start new careers. Um, or if they're unable to do that or don't want to continue working, simply retire and um, have some leisure time after a lifetime of work. Um, un encore careers are one way to experience the freedom and choice that in, an in Social Security with increased benefits could provide. Thank you. Okay, next in line, just a, a, a couple of remarks. Well, if there was ever a better example of one size does not fit all, not sure what it is. I mean, uh, you know, you're channeling, channeling with all the remarks here. But, but there's no question but that uh, one component for a, a significant segment of our society that could augment their retirement income would be work. I mean, I, just, you know, a couple little snippets of things that I remember from the past about 25 years ago. Uh, visited Bulgaria and talked to the chief actor of Bulgaria, who was probably about my age then. Uh, and he said the only secure source of income in retirement is a job. Uh, you know, and there, there, there is that to some extent for those who can. Uh, another guy named that probably all of you remember from your economics textbook when you were in college, Paul Samuelson, about five years ago before he passed away, was asked at a conference, uh, so, you know, what's your source of retirement income and uh, what are you doing with your investments? And he says, well, you know, my source of income, my investment, that's my human capital. So he was channeling on the same thing. Now, he was in the select group of people who still had the capability to, to, to carry on and to keep working. For those who can, though, I, I think there's a very good point to be taken here to encourage people to work more beyond where possibly our earlier generations have gone. Clearly, more work. Uh, for as long as people can, uh, and also more savings and accumulation of money and buying annuities, working at both ends of the spectrum would be a really good thing. So if we want to, if we want to all move towards this direction of having people in better shape uh, undo some of these shortfalls of retirement income that, that are, are easily noted for, for the elders in, in the future, uh, let's work more towards having real annuitization instead of people taking lump sum distributions from all kinds of things when they reach 65 and buying that boat or the trip around the world or whatever, actually buying an annuity and having it uh, uh, saved toward, toward the future. Social Security is, of course, as, as Nancy pointed out, it is one of those annuities. It's an annuity you can't walk away from. Thank goodness there is one such annuity. Uh, but what's critical about this, and, and several people now, David, have, have mentioned that Social Security offers the possibility of buying extra annuity. How? Well, if we have a 62-year-old, and we have some little charts on this, if, if you have a 62-year-old and you, your career average earnings were about 20 grand, that's about the 25th percentile of all our retirees, and you retire at 62, you'll get a benefit, a monthly benefit for the rest of your life that's equivalent to about 40% of what your career average earnings were. 40%, that's a good start. 
That's one of the, what we used to call the three-legged stool, one leg of it. So 40% if you start at 62 receiving your benefit. If you're a, a high earner, you know, like a lot of people in this room probably, and you made equivalent to our $110,000 taxable maximum throughout your career, then you get about 20% replacement from Social Security in the scheduled benefits. However, if these same folks were to wait three years and start taking their benefits at 65 through an encore career, through whatever means, then their benefit would go from 40% replacement and 20% for the highest earner to 50% and 25%. So clearly, there's real opportunity here. And if they work past 65, you can get even more of a boost in terms of the retirement income just from Social Security, Social Security relative to the average earnings level you had throughout your lifetime. So there, there are real possibilities if people can work longer, if they can find other means to not draw on their benefits quite as quickly, uh, they can really augment the level of their retirement income, which after all, let's face it, once you are retired, when, when that day happens, uh, the amount of monthly income you have from day to day, from month to month, is what really matters. Uh, the lifetime amount of earnings and income is good, but it's, it's the monthly amount that really matters. Uh, David mentioned some of the stuff that uh, we had done uh, for a Senate Finance Committee hearing, uh, what, a couple of years ago, and there was a lot of stuff there. Let me give you one little snippet, one of the scenarios that they had asked about, and that is what if people age 62 and over all, to, all were going to work in the future 10% more? than we're projecting that they will be. And let me just mention in our projections with our trustees' assumptions for the trustees' report, we already assume that there will be some increases uh, for people looked at by age and by sex. There will be increases in the tendency to be in the workforce in the future uh, on the basis of people living longer and living, we expect, healthier in the future to the extent they're living longer, uh, which would give them a greater ability to work uh, and also, we believe they'll do this because of a perceived greater necessity. If you're going to live longer and you want to retire at the same age, you've got to do one or two things. You have to save a whole lot more during those years of work because you can have a longer retirement period or don't retire so fast. Uh, work, work a little bit longer. So if we were to expand even more by 10 percent the level of uh, work that we're assuming people will have in the future, that would fix about 5 percent of the shortfall for Social Security. Uh, just to give you a couple little facts and, and figures, not too many, I hope. Uh, if we look from 1990, just 20 years ago, to 2010, the percentage of men age 65 and over that were employed jumped from 15 to 22 percent. That's pretty good for, for all kinds of good reasons. Uh, part of that, of course, is the boost. Uh, now, now, these are people actually in, no, these are people in the labor force. And we've got to remember when the recession hit, we had a very interesting situation. We knew that because when this big recession hit, there had been some drop in the value of assets. We knew that there might be some tendency for people to want to work longer to rebuild their assets. But at the same time, there was unemployment, so we thought maybe people would drop out. Well, the bottom line is we had both more people filing for Social Security retirement disability benefits and more people seeking employment. So uh, people understood this and they took it seriously. They were really trying to find ways to get employment. Over that same period from 1990, to 2010, women went from 8% in the labor force to 14% in the labor force. This is on an age-adjusted basis for 65 and over. So these are true increases. We're projecting that both of those numbers will rise into the future, a little bit more for women than for men. Uh, what David was mentioning a little bit before where we had this sort of approach that conceivably could eliminate half of Social Security's uh, long-term deficit would be a rather aggressive, not, Im not totally implausible, but a rather aggressive approach, which would say, what if uh, out in the future we had men and women both working at the same rates they were on a non-age-adjusted basis at ages 45 and over back in 1950? Well, that's, that's a somewhat strained, strained example. Uh, back in 1950, for example, we had 92 percent of all men between ages 45 and 64 working in, uh, in, in, in the labor force. Uh, today we have about 78 percent for men and about 66 percent for women. So that would be really a quite dramatic increase in employment. At 65 and over, we had 46 percent of men working. Uh, at ages 65 and over today, we have 22 percent for men and 14 percent for women. A lot of that is just because of the average age at 65 and over has gone up so much. So it's a little bit of a strained example. And there are some other demographic factors going on, like an increasing share of our population is other than legal, and therefore we don't expect them to be working and contributing to Social Security. But the bottom line is that if through encore careers, through whatever kinds of encouragement can be provided, we can get a greater share 
of Americans as they age to continue to work, continue to work in the same job if they can, continue to work in some other job hopefully that will contribute to society more than just receipt of their own benefits. That can really make a difference for Social Security. But the one last point I would make here is something that people in the Senate Finance Committee were, were very, very aware of, and we all should be. People working longer not only can help Social Security a little bit, it can help our whole society, not just in terms of the public service provided, but when people work longer, they're paying personal income taxes longer, the whole tax structure, the budget deficits for the entire government would be helped substantially and to a greater degree really even than Social Security would be. Because when you work longer for Social Security, you're going to get some extra benefits as a result. For the other portions of government, when you work longer and pay more personal income tax, you're just kicking in more money to help pay for the bills of government. So uh, I, I, think, I think we would all agree encouraging those who can to work longer is really a good thing, and uh, I, I think this effort is great. And I'm glad to hear that New America is also involved in pushing for people to have more savings and better use of those savings to put it into an annuitized form to last their whole life. I'm going to somewhat agree with Phil in a very small amount, <laughs> even though he depressed me to tears when he started off. I just wanted to. <laughs> um, I do agree that there's a bit of um, a danger with the Encore career movement, that it is sounding a little bit too elite at a time when we don't have that luxury. But on the other hand, I'm going to take a, a glass half full approach instead of a glass half empty approach and I see Encore careers as part of just one piece of p a potential to do a major transformation of the way we work in this country. And it's a transformation that if we can do it correctly and get not only the Encore career piece right but some other pieces, it's going to help not only the current generation of workers or the boomers, but it is going to help all the other generations as well. Um, you know, people are living longer lives. They are healthier to a great extent. They're looking to strike a work-life balance that enables them to remain productive members of society. And they're looking for continued work options if the right mix of benefits and incentives are available. And the innovative policies and practices and also opportunities, frankly, that older workers are seeking in the workplace right now are, again, good for all age groups, not just older workers. And it's also, that's true whether we're talking about encore careers or whether we're talking about lifetime careers. You know, there are actually people in this world who do exist who have been doing the same thing for 30 years and absolutely positively love it and are terrified at the thought that they might lose that opportunity just because they're getting to be, oh my God, 65. So we also have to look at those people too and, at, and, and some of the programs that we're working on at AARP are trying to address that. Um, when I was introduced as the uh, director of the Massachusetts State Office at AARP, I am, but I'm here in D.C. on a temporary assignment for six months trying to help reboot the association's approach to the 50-plus jobs initiative or the 50-plus worker initiative. And one of the things that we've realized over the last several months is that we need to also put more emphasis or more attention to the employers themselves because we need to make the employers realize that older workers are good workers, whether it's an encore career opportunity or, again, whether it's that person who's been in the same job for 30 years and loves going to work every morning. So we need to get that message across, and we need to couple that message with this isn't just a, a do-good situation or a feel-good situation. This is also we need to do a better job at making the business case for keeping older workers on the job. Again, whether it's an encore career opportunity or something else. Um, so we're exploring some ways to make new bridges, more use of social media. Um, our Best Employers Award, for example, is recognizing employers who are ahead of the curve and who are seeing what older workers want to see in the workplace, meaning they want flexible job options. Uh, they want opportunities for professional development. They want opportunities for mentoring younger persons. They also want 
the benefits, they need the health benefits, and they also want continued opportunities for savings or a 401k or something like that. It's, it's a big, it's a big, uh, you know, it's, a, it's the whole package. But in return, the employers are seeing that older workers are reliable, they're committed, um, they are knowledgeable, and they're eager to learn new things. So again, I think the Encore career piece is just, it is, it is a very valuable piece, but it is just one piece of the potential for a greater transformation. And I'll just end, I know we're, we're almost out of time here. I think everyone running for public office in this country right now, and I don't care if they're a town manager or if they're the President of the United States, they should be able to clearly articulate what their vision of aging is for this country or their town or whatever the situation is. And when I mean what their vision of aging is, it's not only what are they going to do to meet the needs of this aging population, but what are they going to do to capitalize on the talents of this aging population. And Encore Careers is a part of that. It isn't just shoring up Social Security or fixing Medicare. It's Encore Careers, it's age-friendly communities, it's uh, you know civic engagement. These pieces all fit together. And if we can start to taking more of that holistic approach towards it, we can see how Encore Careers will help Social Security. We can see how Encore Careers can help build stronger communities. It's, it's a multifaceted approach and we need to look at it that way. Thank you. Great. Thanks for those uh, those responses. So, um, so I think before opening it up for uh, for your questions out in the the audience, I'd like to ask I, I think at least at least one question here of my own, um, which is uh, coming back to the um, the types of of encore careers. I suppose you know if you look at this most most broadly, I mean it could be that um, you know somebody's encore career could be um, you know wood carvings or, 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 or something like that but I, but I think what you know part of what's very appealing about the uh, the encore pro career proposal and the way Senator Wofford spoke about it is the idea of having kind of a, a, a an extra an, you know an additional win right the win-win of of social purpose jobs so uh, you know David and, and and then others I wonder if you could if you could mention like what do you foresee as being um, the largest source of these social purpose jobs? Like where would they tend to be? And then also, is there enough of it? Because there's 78 million boomers, and obviously this would be a roaring success if, you know, m maybe if 10 or 20 million people got involved, but, but where, wh where would they be able to do social purpose work, and can some of these institutions in education, healthcare, and so on, absorb these people? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I think we found that the most popular uh, encore career is actually teaching, and a lot of people uh, had a sort of aspiration to go be a teacher when they were younger. They went into some other field for for any number of reasons, and they want to get back to it. Um, there's, you know, budget budgets are tight now, so that so hiring has been constrained. But there still is a sort of chronic shortage of math and science and special ed and 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 teachers in other fields. So teaching is a is a key one, and there's and some of the programs that train and certify teachers are are still um, uh, overflowing with applicants. We think there's a huge potential for all sorts of new roles. There's a sort of emerging category of health navigators, um, uh, people that are either lay people or, or, or encore health professionals themselves who help people uh, ask the right questions at doctors, stay on their treatment plans. Um, the, in the Affordable Care Act, um, uh, such, such as it is, um, <laughs> uh, there's, there's a lot of incentives for, say, hospitals to re reduce uh, Medicare readmission rates, and there's incentives for that, and health navigators can help hospitals meet those goals, and therefore there's sort of an economic uh, rationale for that. All, healthcare, obviously, you know, um, uh, there's uh, insurance companies, for example, have an incentive to help people uh, who are pre-diabetic not uh, proceed to full diabetes, and so the, they're they're financing, say, YMCA's to help people uh, uh, to 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 hire uh, health coaches to help people uh, get more exercise, lose weight, and 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 avoid going to full diabetes. Um, so there's all sorts of ways that part-time or even full-time roles can be reconfigured, as as Debbie was saying, to meet the needs. And and you know these don't all have to be you know, encore roles. There can be jobs uh, for younger people as well that are in these kind of things. But there are certain roles that where experience uh, actually does matter and where, um, uh, and, and where that kind of human touch is, is essential. So um, 
Uh, we do think that there are jobs there. The nonprofit sector jobs are actually been growing even during the downturn, whereas private sector uh, jobs have been have been shrinking. Um, in the long term, uh, this very same phenomena of baby boomer retirements actually creates talent shortages in a number of fields. Um, that that other boomers perhaps moving into those jobs can can help fill. So, um, uh, you know, there's obviously a job shortage now, but there, you know, the, re the recovery will at some point uh, be a full-fledged recovery, and we think there will be jobs. One one other quick question I had, I may or may not be quick, but um, you know, S Stephen I think made a good. I'm just trying to juxtapose a little bit what Stephen and Phil were saying. Because Stephen made a good case for which you might call the ROI, right, the return on investment from this trend because it's not only going to help shore up uh, Social Security but also contribute to, you know, the fiscal health of the country in general, pr you know, d promote economic activity and, and, and so on. Uh, but then as Phil said that, you know, certainly it looks like, you know, and, and I would be most concerned about, you know, th you know, the half, half of the older workers who um, say are are you know less educated and or below median income, and you know may have a more difficult transition to these sorts of um, jobs. You know, so you so any anybody can disagree that the transition is any different. But to the extent that the transition for the the lower wage, you know, the bottom two tercels, you might say, is going to be more difficult. What sort of supports will be needed? Like what, what sort of policy? initiatives like training, expansions of community colleges. I, I'm not sure what's involved, but I think it would be good just to, to be thinking about, you know, that we're going to need to do more than just, um, you know, say, say here, here are these jobs. Stephen? Let me just offer, I think there's real connectivity between these first two questions. Think about where do we have a growth industry in this country coming up on us? We have the age of, aging of America. We always talk about it because the boomers are going to be retiring. Well, it's really because there were fewer, fewer babies born since 1965. So there are fewer workers for every boomer that will be retiring in the future than we've had for retiring generations in the past. So if, if we have this split of the boomers as they, as they age, some of them are going to be in better shape. Some are not going to be in such good shape. One area where we really have, I mean, I know I've got a parent in assisted living right now. I bet a lot of people in this room have parents who are in assisted living or will be in the future. If baby boomers are going to be retiring and looking for something productive, helpful, community service to do, they could help out at an assisted living. Uh, there's a tremendous desire for people when they get to be older and are really not capable of taking care of themselves fully to stay at home. My gosh, what an opportunity to have people go and help out the very older folks that need help to go to them and help them stay in their homes rather than go to an assisted living or a nursing home. I think there's just a tremendous demand for this today, and it's going to do nothing but increase dramatically in the future. So 60-somethings helping 80-somethings, maybe. Perfect. <laughs> yeah. Phil? Yeah. There's a lot of truth to that, but I think we also need to confront the at least partial reality that there is labor competition between the generations. Not, I'm not a fixed pie kind of guy. I don't believe every immigrant to this comes to this country takes a job from somebody else. I don't think everybody woman that gets in the workforce takes a job from a man. But the laws of supply and demand are not repealed in the labor market. And I think most young people could relate to uh, the experience of having baby boomers on top of you in some organization that will not get out of the way. <laughs> Right now, you mentioned uh, teaching. Right, we've we, you know, far from the public sector employment growing, we, you know, we've had this gigantic downsizing, particularly of teachers. All every state in the union's got hundreds of thousands of teachers laid off. Uh, do we really want to take volunteer labor of you know restless senior citizens who and do-gooders and use them? get them to teach our kids instead of hiring some teachers back. I'm not sure the trade-off is exactly that stark, but there's certainly a dimension to that. And I, I think this is, is very helpful. And, and just adding to that, you know, just to, as part of the reality, you know, we do have the, the continuing high unemployment rate. We have age discrimination, even though we have age discrimination laws, we, 
we've been cutting back EEOC enforcement. We need to, to beef that up if we're really serious about um, older workers. And of course, healthcare costs are going, um, rising very rapidly. And the Ryan budget today, uh, which is voted on today, is, is calling for an increase in the Medicare age to 67, which w if that were ever to go through, would make employment of older workers extremely unlikely because it would be so expensive for um, employers to, to have them. They'd be the, the less, least expensive part of Medicare, but the most expensive part of private pensions. So that has to inform the whole debate. I think the aspirations we've been talking about today are terrific, and I think we all applaud them. But we need public policies that are, have a realistic uh, supporting both the young and the old. I, I just want to add one thing. I, first of all, we're absolutely ecstatic, even when the the, the comments are, are critical of Encore Careers, just to have the conversation be about how to get Encore Careers established and what the obstacles could be and how we might overcome them. So we welcome the, the, the pushback. But I will say one thing. Um, we often bear the burden of having to uh, uh, sort of defend all of the questions about how older people can actually work longer, when in fact those questions should be put to those who would just say just raise the retirement age for Social Security or, or the Medicare age without any discussion of what those people are supposed to be doing. We're actually saying let's find roles that people can work in when they may be physically uh, physically uh, 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 have physical hardships, or let's find um, ways uh, to 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 put people to work in jobs that require and and call for sort of the experience of age, and therefore don't send older workers uh, into say retail or fast food where they are directly competitive with younger people. So, so you know we're partly advocates for this, so we have an answer to everything, but at some level, uh, at some level, we think Encore Careers are the response to some of the very criticisms that, that you're raising, Phil, um, uh, in, in the sense that uh, you can get out of the way of those younger people uh, uh, wanting to move up the ladder because you have an Encore career to go to. Um, you can do a job that requires some, some, some of your experience and therefore not compete for the low-end job or the entry-level job with, with a younger person. Well, I, I totally agree with that, right? But, but here's where I'm coming from, where I work. As I see this, the principal vulnerability of Social Security today appears to be, the polls say, and, and certainly the Republicans say, right, that the thing we, we're most likely to do is raise the retirement age, um, which strikes me as about the cruelest, crudest, stupidest thing we could ever do, <laughs> right, be for all the reasons I laid out. At least half the generation is, will be lucky to hold on to 67, right? So the question is, you know, do you, do you just want to cede that to them? Say, so, oh, we're going to raise, okay, so we're raising the retirement age. Here's some ways we can ameliorate all the damage. We're going to you know, do encore careers. Or do we hold the line here and say, N you know what? We're not going to raise the retirement age. There's all kinds of independent reasons why older people should have the freedom and the opportunity to, to be full participants in our society but it has nothing to do with whether or not we raise the retirement age. But it, it sounds to me as though you're not really speaking at cross purposes here. I mean, if, if you would rather not see the retirement age increase, if it could turn out that through Encore Careers or other approaches, we could improve the financial status of Social Security and the federal budget as a whole, that actually would diminish the pressure that some people might be calling for to increase the retirement age and do other things of that sort. Uh, the one thing, I mean, just going back to your point about the competition, some of us are old enough to remember back a few decades back when everybody thought when the boomers were going to retire and we're going to have the shift in the age distribution, have all these people retired in so few working age, the demand for labor in this country was going to be so much, then everybody would have to keep working to much higher ages. Well, a funny little thing called outsourcing and, and other issues sort of came up. And, and lots of blue collar jobs manufacturing are not so much on our, our shores anymore. But that's why I, I really emphasize the idea that we should look at where the demand will be, where the jobs will be. And, and I, I relate to the idea of, hey, think when we were little kids, do we want to have, you know, somebody like me or, you know, you know, in, in their teaching, or would we rather have a young, vibrant, energetic person teaching? I think there's something to that. But there are some things that we can do in our 60s, like helping the people in their 80s, that really there's going to be a tremendous demand for, a tremendous need for, and I think we would probably be pretty good at it. And I think it really comes down to this, this point that Dave raised about the carrot versus the stick. I mean, the reason raising the unemployment, age, um, the retirement age um, would keep people in the workforce is that they couldn't afford to retire. It's, it's, it's you know, and raising, raising the early 
age with some talk about does that even worse. What the encore careers, though, are, are inspiring people who choose to stay into the, in the um, workforce. So I think what I, what, I, what I hear people saying, and what I certainly think, is that it should be a choice and not a requirement. You, you let people have dignity and freedom in old age to make those choices. So we're running out of time, so, uh, so I want to give a chance for the audience. If, uh, and Senator Wofford said that he would be willing to um, answer a question as well. So, um, and yeah, and we'll run, you know, till uh, 2 p.m. I think this might have been scheduled to 1.45, but we obviously need a little more time. But feel free to, if, if you need to go. So I don't know if, 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 if uh, folks uh, out there have, uh, have any, uh, any, any question. Um, <laughs> oh, one over here. Hi, I'm Dr. Caroline Poplin. I'm a Charter Baby Boom member. I applied for Medicare uh, last week. And I'm here to tell you that Encore careers are difficult, uh, even for the elite. I retired from the federal government. I was a, I retired from the federal government in 2007. I was a lawyer for my first career and a physician for my second career. And I thought, well, that makes me perfectly suited to go into health policy, which is what I really wanted to do. And I, it became apparent right away that there would be no money. I would have to live on my pension. It's, it's a nice pension, but it's 40% of what I was making. Um, and I ran into a brick wall in this town, um, including here. Uh, they, wanted, uh, they either wanted very distinguished people who'd made a career in health policy, or they wanted young, promising people that they could mentor into the next generation of health policy. So with all the will and all the expertise and uh, agreeing to work for nothing, um, I couldn't. Yeah, that's an interesting perspective, which I'm not, in certain, in certain areas, especially in D.C., not too, not, uh, too surprised about. Did, oh, you were, yes, did you have? Hi, and I'm, my name is Patricia DeVecchio. I have a consulting business called International Purpose. Uh, Deborah, I really liked what you had to say because I think it was a very balanced look at, at the whole situation. Um, and I believe we need to totally rewrite the way we do work and the way we define work, that it's a very, very old model, doesn't serve us, doesn't allow us to evolve as, as human beings. You know, doesn't really always feed the pocketbook and the soul at the same time. And we just need to start from a clean slate. You know, we need to really, really think inventively, as the senator said here. Really think out of the box. I know some of us were talking beforehand about how the United States is somewhat behind the curve as far as the way it looks like, looks at a person's working career. In other countries, it is very acceptable to sort of dip in and out or up and down without having, you know, making the choice to step away from a high-powered position for a few months. You know, around here, that tends to be a career killer. You know, whereas in other places, it's viewed as recharging. So if we can, again, start to transform the workplace across the generations, and what we are doing, again, for older workers, I think, has the potential to do that. But we but it is have to be a transformative process for the entire working experience for all people. Mm -hmm. Questions back there as well. Um, yes, right, right here. Oh, in the green. <laughs> um, thank you very much to the panelists. I found the whole conversation quite interesting. My well, name is Karen Lash. Yes, my name is Karen Lashman, and I'm now in independent consultant. I'm um, a sort of, I say, forced retiree because I worked in the UN system which has mandatory retirement at age 62, um, for those who don't know that. But um, what I wanted to pick up on is Ms. Banda's point and also the first um, commenters, which is about the need for though a whole culture change because as I seek employment now, um, and because, like many people in this room, I had very senior level positions, there's no credibility with younger work. The people that are often going to hire you for these encore careers are younger. And, you know, the reality is they see you as a threat. You can tell them that, and it's true in 
my case and many people's case. I've been there, done that. I do not want to move up in management in your organization. I would like to be able to mentor younger people. I know I have a wonderful skill set um, from international work that I can bring to the workplace. And they, um, by and large, I have found in this town, or at least I haven't tried in other markets yet, are quite threatened by senior level people that have an impressive resume. So that is a reality for people seeking Encore. And even when you're saying, I have a pension, and I'm not looking for, you know, therefore a high salary, um, the reality still hits that those people are very, the people that are in those employment decisions, even for part time, are extremely reluctant. So I would say in addition to your work with ARP on the 50 plus and in and the employers is really promoting, as I said, a more of a culture change even among younger people that can see the benefits of older people and don't feel so threatened. And I think that's a huge challenge. Is there any, any reaction to that? Or? So I think we're, we're out of time, but if, um, if there's any final, final comment that anyone wants to make from the well, panel, I just mean, to. I would just say to the, to the two comments that go to the difficulties of it, I mean, that's, that's why we need this, this sea change in, in, in attitudes. I mean, we're not trying to paint a picture that it's all, uh, that it, that it's all rosy because, um, you know, then, we, then we, we, there wouldn't be the work to do. So, so you know, we think that uh, both the changes in employer attitudes, as, as Debbie was saying, and, um, and, and new kinds of roles that do make sense both for, the, for people and, and for organizations are, are sorely needed. And just one final point is when I hear people say that right now isn't the time to be talking about Encore careers because the economy is so bad and there's still a high unemployment rate, this whole transformation, it's a movement and it's going to take time and it's not going to happen overnight. And if we put it on the shelf right now when we really need it, it's not going to be there. So we can't keep using the current economy as an excuse to not be acting on some of this stuff, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I think you know so much. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> Go ahead. Oh, so much um, in Washington we talk about, and Senator Wofford referred to this that oh, people are growing old. It's such a problem. And suppose you know it's not a problem if it, in the individual case, um, and that Social Security it's a problem. It's got this financing shortfall decades away and such a problem, rather than seeing both the aging of the population and Social Security as a real asset. Um, that can, that, that these are solutions and these are, and it requires the sea change in the case of Social Security. It requires pushing back against the conventional wisdom, but I think they all are opportunities and challenges, uh, opportunities and strengths and assets that can make the country better. All right. Well, thank you very much for attending the event and thanks to our, all of our speakers. This was really, really informative. Thank you.